Hi everybody, I'm Jackson Jones and welcome to another webinar at the Biker Bar. There are a whole lot more webinars to come, so check the Biker Bar website and subscribe to the monthly newsletter so that you don't miss any live events. Now for today's webinar, each May and June, the Isle of Man turns into motorcycle nirvana as the world's greatest road racers gather to test themselves against an incredible 37 mile or 60 kilometre mountain course made up of the island's public roads. The Isle of Man TT is often referred to as one of the most dangerous racing events in the world. Today, I'm joined by Ian Locker, 10 times TT winner, as well as many more podium finishes, including 14 times second. Ian, welcome to the Biker Bar. <clears throat> it's interesting, you know more, more of the stats than me. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I knew I had 10, 10 TT wins, but, I, you know, I, um, I didn't know how many sort of rostrums and all that sort of thing, you know, so. I think, um, I think a lot of people would be happy just to win one. Yeah, it's hard, you know. Um, yeah, you need um, a lot of dedication, um, a lot of luck. Uh, not a lot of luck. Um, you need some luck, like yeah. in anything, but um, you need uh, good people with you. You need to do your homework, especially. Um, it's a bit like doing an apprenticeship, you know. You you only get out of it when you put into it. And, um, yeah, you need to have the right people around you, right machinery, tires mechanics and you sort of having run my own thing for a long time now um i think that's doing your homework like i say it comes back to that because once you do that then you you do all this anyway and then you hopefully keep yourself safe as well you know yeah sure uh, can i ask you um by give me um a rundown of um of your racing history and and a little bit about um what you're up to now yeah um well i started racing in 1982 mm -hmm. which is now i've just passed my 40th 40th year in this sport so um which is which is pretty crazy when i first started i never thought i'd i'd make 30 years old so um now i'm heading towards 59 so it's uh yeah where's the time gone but yeah, so I started in 1982 and um, not really knowing where the Isle of Man was um, mm. and road racing as such. You know, I come from South Wales. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, <clears throat> um, only interested really in the short circuits, you know, the Brands Hatch and Silverstone, etc. cetera, um, these type of circuits, you know. Yeah. And um, I, I, I was lucky enough to get a, a sponsor to um and i was helped by an x-ray called clive watts mm -hmm. and he helped me to go to get this sponsor which uh, who would help him and um he wanted to go to the alaman well i didn't even know what the alaman was so um <laughs> but he promised me a, a a new 250 um for the following year to do the manx grand prix and i said yeah and then it meant that i could ride it on the short circuit yeah so we ended up um the 250 never came by the way but um until about eight years later but anyway <laughs> uh that's another story um so yeah so that's where i started and then we went to the southern 100 in, in the Alaman first which is down near castletown mm -hmm. and i really enjoyed it um i had some good results i was second newcomer second best newcomer sort of top 10 which is really good you know in that in, in that field yeah on a riding a tz 350 yamaha and um so that's that's the way I had my actual roads um, started, um, and then from there I've never missed a year. Uh, so I've been going to the Isle of Man since 1983. So 83 was my first time at the Southern Hundred. Then when we were there, we went to have a look at the circuit, which is only sort of 10 miles away, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I rode around the circuit I think once, or well, it might have been twice. <laughs> To try and learn it, and I, then I went. <laughs> and, I went. <laughs> and um, like I say, as you said, it, it's a big, big place. Thirty, almost thirty-eight miles. So yeah, it's a lot, lot to learn and take in. But um, yeah, uh, you've got to be dedicated and mm. um, really, really um, learn the place. You know, otherwise, you, you know, you, you're accident waiting to happen, sort of thing. Um, so then, I returned. Uh, I I returned to the Manx Grand Prix in the September. This is from the July to the September. 
mm-hmm. and um because in those days there was nothing to learn there was you know you, you there were no dvds or yeah. you know um even no, dvds you know no, there, there wasn't even any cassette tape you know <laughs> <laughs> so uh you know let alone internet you know so um it was just a case of go there and go round and round the van um and then we, i didn't have enough money for the pets off the van so <laughs> I, I think i limited it to about i think it was not eight eight or nine laps and then it's just get going that's it you, you yeah. get a novice track it and off you go down bray hill and um and it was it was it was great you know i i found it i found it a lot easier than riding short circuits because short circuit i always had to really try really really hard to get the results that i did um but uh, for the for the alaman to me it, it came fairly easy and not easy but it's never easy but it became easier than a, a lot of people talk about it, you know? Right. <clears throat> and then, uh, so I did the Mount Grand Prix alongside Steve Islop, Robert Dunlop, um, Ian Newton, Jim McDonnell. There was a load of good riders that year. Um, and I, I re- yeah, I enjoyed it. And I was lucky enough to finish third um, behind mm-hmm. Steve Islop and Robert Dunlop. So it was, uh, yeah, it's just the three of us went on to be sort of, you know, win races at, at the DT. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was certainly a good year. And and then like I said, every year since then I've been back every every single year and sometimes the Max as well. Yeah. Not all the classic TT, you know. And you'll be back again this year? Yeah, um, I'm running a team at the TT. Mm-hmm. I'm not racing myself. <clears throat> and uh, we've got uh, four riders, I think it is at the moment. Three, uh, four riders. And um, I'll be doing that. Um, but racing at the, I was going to say the classic TT, now it's called the Manx Grand Prix. Yep. Recently, it's changed back to the Manx Grand Prix again, which used to be the classic and Manx Grand Prix combined. Now they're just called the, uh, the Manx. Yep. Uh, so I'll be riding three bikes of that. So, yeah, right. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that because we've had two years away, obviously, and with through COVID. Mm. Um, so it'll be nice to see people and fans and and supporters of the place, you know, and um, really looking forward to it. Yeah, awesome. So, what actually got you into motorcycle racing in the first place? What attracted you to that? Um, it's a bit of a weird one because <laughs> I was my dad used to have bikes on the road, but never mm. raced before I was born. Uh, so I was the youngest of four kids. Um, my brother, then my next next one up to me, was five years older, mm-hmm. Nigel, and he used to take me on the back of his bike on a Z900 when he when he was like eighteen and I was twelve or thirteen or something. Yeah. Um. So it came from there, but then I was always nicking his bike and riding it on the roads <laughs> illegally, and and you know I was fairly crazy, and fairly, fairly nuts really, to be honest. Um. And then I got caught by the police riding up and down the road on his uh, 100 uh, Yamaha 100 and I was banned so they, I didn't have a license yet you don't get to your 16 in the UK yeah but they, they actually banned me before I actually started <laughs> actually started riding on the road so when I actually got a license I had to wait a couple of months because you know it uh, it went over the three years so sort of like so which is a bit annoying and I couldn't <laughs> wait to get on the an FS20 and Yamaha and ride around, the, you know, as a 16-year-old. And I went everywhere. It was brilliant, you know. Uh, but I've always loved bikes. And the racing side of it is um, I was basically um, riding on the roads for those next few years from then up until I was, um, until I started racing, was about 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, but up until this stage, I'd been banned again um because i was <laughs> i was burning off the police and being chased and also i was mad you know <laughs> and that's so i needed someone to help me really sure. and uh, yeah so I, I just happened to go to uh, a circuit in south wales called clando uh not far from where i live mm-hmm. with a friend and uh we were just watching i'd actually gone there illegally on a bike as well <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound very good to this, does it? Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I ended up, went, we both went to the circuit and we were watching the racing and he says to me, do you ever fancy a bit of that? And I said, never thought about it. Mm. He said, there's a guy that goes in the pub tonight and we'll see him and we'll just talk to him about it. 
um, and he used to race uh, Max Norton. And uh, we talked to him, uh, a guy called Colin Jones, and he and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll lend you leathers. I'll give you the address of the ACU, you know, the governing body for the road racing license. But he said, I'll warn you now. He said, it's like a bug. You won't get rid of it. <laughs> and here we are, 40, exactly 42 years later. Uh, or 40 years later, I should say. And um, yeah, exactly 40, 40 years now. So it, it's a bit strange. I'm still doing it. Um, but it did get me off riding bikes on the road. So it's probably saved, saved myself, really. You know, it's probably safer for me to be on the tracks than, um, you know, to be on the on the short, um, on, on the road, you know. <laughs> but I was, um, but I had no illusions of, of anything. You know, I, I didn't mm. think I could do anything or be any good or I was really open-minded about it. And um, yeah, um, just turned out that I was, that was really okay with it. So yeah. Um, yeah, and I just sort of took it steady away. I started on a, Yamaha RD um, 400, mm-hmm. um, which is um, uh, which is a really good bike at the time. It's all I could afford, but I was up against like um, Yamaha LC 350s, yep. which were a bit quicker and handled a bit better. Um, but it taught me to ride harder. And I've mm-hmm. always thought, I've always had that uh, thing in me since, that if you've got a bit of slower bike, once you d- if you chip away at it for a year or two, and then all of a sudden you get given a really decent bike. Yeah. You just click, you know, because you've had to ride so hard to just to be competitive and um it sort of works out works out the best best way now. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, did you <laughs> did you have someone that you looked up to at the time as a racer or well yeah Clive um Clive Watts I said he he uh he was um he jacked in racing uh maybe a year or two before. Yeah. And um, so I never watched him race or anything, but mm. my brother knew him. And um, then he lent me some leathers. I went to see him and he said, yeah, I can help you a bit. Um, so then he lent me a van, but I had to repair the van first and spray it and rub it down and all this sort of stuff. And then I used to um, go down there after work and start working on his cars and for, for the for the payment of the van, basically. Yeah. Um, I, I did all this repairing and, you know, um, like a body shop, basically. Um, but it was a coach uh, uh, coach business. And, um, yeah, I used to, used to spray the bikes for me and then fly, and then I started spraying them myself after that because yeah. I was damaging them. So I was so bad at crashing in the beginning <laughs> that um, I did my first year, I was okay. But then the next year, I really started to go really well. It was either go really well or crash. Um but um, which, um, but I, I didn't really get hurt. I broke a collarbone a couple of times in the mm. beginning, but I didn't really get hurt as such, you know. Um, but and whatever color was on the on the shelf, uh, when we got back to uh, his workshop, I'd repair it and say, right, what color is the bike going to be this week? <laughs> so yeah, we'd have a red and white bike, or we'd have a blue and white bike, or we'd have an all green bike, or whatever, you know. <laughs> None of this corporate stuff, you know. It's um, it was uh, it was good, you know. It's just uh, that's how it was in those days, and yeah. and then the next week I knew I'd be repairing it again anyway. So, um, so then I was spraying it again every night, you know, until we went away again. So um, yeah, it was it was hard graft. But I look back, I think I had some dedication, you know, and I don't know why I had it. I remember asking myself sometimes, you know, why why did I keep going at it? Why you know, yeah. thinking all my friends are out, you know, down the pub. Hmm facing girls and all that sort of thing. And, you know, I was rubbing fairings down and things for night after night after night. You know? <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, it all came, it came all right in the end, I suppose. But, um, yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah. How would you explain the Isle of Man TT to someone who's never seen it before? Um, it's fairly scary to watch, I would say. Mm. Mm. Um, like I, I myself don't get that much of a chance to watch um, because I'm always at the moment these days team manager in the, in the pits, you know, yep. looking after people and <clears throat> you have to be around the paddock area. So you never get a chance to watch much. But if you do, you haven't got to walk far. It doesn't matter where, which direction you're going. It's all fairly scary, especially the first part. You go down Bray Hill, we call it. And like on a super bike, you'll be just, you'll be going past the grandstand at the top. At um, 
in fifth gear, then into sixth gear just before you start to go down very ill. Yeah. And it's flat out, you know. So you'd be doing at least 175 mile an hour before you hit the bottom of the hill. So it's, but it it sounds just madness. But I, I always yeah. say the road racing is calculated madness. Mm. You have to be very calculating to be to get to that level anyway. Right. And then um, even more calculating to you know to do it, be good at it, and survive as well. You know. Um, so yeah, it, it's fairly scary to watch, and people say, "Oh, the, the mad men, there's this, there's that." But it's not. It's very calculating, you know? like anything in any motorsport. You know, you can't just, um, you know, jump into a rally car and be world champion or something. You, you know, and it looks cr- they're crazy, but they're very in control of it. And even though um, such a thing as that rally cars are close to the trees and cliffs and. Yeah. everything they know they know to the inch what they're doing you know it's a, it's the same with the alamand um but it's a fantastic thing to watch and you know if anybody uh, some people don't have never been then if they get a chance to go then you know it's um it's well worth a visit you know you, you'll never forget it you know like to me you now it becomes almost normal but to ride it or to you know because i know what to expect but when you first go there it's um especially the bikes these days you know they are so fast too. Mm. Uh, but it is a, it is an exciting experience and not just the racing you know there's lots to do on the other man and it's a beautiful place you know in, in just like the scenery type thing of it you know in the middle of the circuit it's it's, it's beautiful you know yeah yeah well you you just mentioned about you know how how fast the bikes are obviously the motorbikes are a lot faster now than when the and i'm, I'm not saying you're around then but um, <laughs> they're a lot faster now than when the TT began in 1907, uh, when the top speed was around 38 miles an hour or, or 60 kilometres an hour. Mm. Um, now the race's uh, lap speeds can be in excess of 125 miles an hour or 200 kilometres an hour. How much faster can motorcycles get around these courses? Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah that that's always been the thing every year people say how can anybody go any faster than that like i think the lap record now is 134 actually 135 mm, yeah. maybe mm. um but that was an exceptional year um about whatever year we're in now <laughs> it was about 2018 i think and there was yeah. a lot of sunshine there was a lot of rubber down on the track and you know wow it was it was just um peter hickman and dean harrison going at it and i think peter hickman's got it at uh and yeah, around that, that sort of speed. But um, I remember when Steve Islop first did the 120 mile an hour mm. um, back in 1989, and everybody said, how can anybody go any faster than that, you know? Yeah. Um, but then it wasn't that long um, before there was 125, and then it was 127, and then 129, then 130, and then John McInnes did that. So it just, things move on, you know, it isn't just the speed, uh, the tyre technology, chassis technology, um, electronics, you know, with uh, helping you get the power down to the, to the, uh, to the road. Um, there's a lots of things. And as it becomes more and more competitive, um, people have to get fitter as well, you know, to handle the speed and power of the bikes, you know, so... Um, that has raised up a lot of the younger riders. Now we'll do a lot of training, um, but yeah, um, things move on. And you know, I'm not saying I'm a fan of, of it going faster and faster. I'm not. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I like racing to the well, the, uh, you know, to the slowest possible speed, if you like. Yeah, that's the best thing about racing to me. And I've always liked the smaller bikes because you can race <clears throat> within one or two seconds of each other at the slowest speed. You know, and that is more fun to me than than doing 200 mile an hour, I'd rather be doing 100 mile an hour. Yeah. Um, and doing 200 mile an hour and, you know, hanging on to one of these superbikes, you know. But um, they are great fun when you're in control of them and when you know what you're doing and if this and if that and if the other, um, you know, and it all, it all comes together. It's, it's They are quite fun. But yeah. when they're not, um, when you know that you're heading off down Braille at the start and you think this thing's not handling or, <clears throat> you know, um, I'm struggling. 
then you've got six laps in front of you, which is 226 miles mm. before the end, which is an hour and a half of torture, <laughs> you know, um, of this thing trying to wrestle, you know, you're trying to wrestle it around and uh, it's trying to pull your arms out of the sockets, like, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when you're in control of it, it just doesn't feel like, you just feel like you're looking down on yourself. It's a, the most weird feeling going. You're most in control and you don't even feel, it almost feels like you're numb. It, it's that mm. greater feeling. Yeah. Um, but when you're not, when it's not in control, it's hard work and you yeah. sweat a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, what do you think makes um, the, the Isle of Man TT unique, a unique race? Um, the fact that uh, it's the only race where you start off uh, at 10 second intervals. Um, so you don't all go off together, you know, so, um, you start number one on the road, then you are go off number one, number two, number three, all the way down to number, uh, well, they, they cut the entries down a little bit this year. I think there are 60 entries in the bigger races now, maybe 70 in the others. Mm-hmm. Um, but they used to be up to 90. Um, so yeah, but it, and then you've got timing, you know, and so the timing you've got splits, um, at certain places. Um, like it says, the TT is time trial, yeah. Um, um, but it's 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 uh difficult to follow sometimes if, if you've not been there, but you have commentary and there are commentary points two or three around the circuit. Although I think this year they've done away with those, uh, so it, all the commentary will be. <clears throat> from online and at the at the, um, at the grandstand, you know, at the start and finish then. Yeah. So, um, but it's, yeah, it's just that um, it's based on a time trial. So, you know, you can win a race starting at number 17 or something um, and never see number 16 and he might be right. your main rival. Yeah. He's 10 seconds in front of you, you. And sometimes you can barely see somebody in front of you. Like, I mean, quarter mile in front of you type thing you know yeah right um, and other times you're catching people within the first two miles of the circuit you might be passing two riders if they're going a lot slower than you or yeah. you might get him passed as well um you know if, if you're not going fast enough so it's a difficult one to gauge you know because you, it's all about you you've, you've got no reference to another rider to outbreak somebody there's a normal short circuit you know you're you're looking at them and thinking, right, I'm going to have outbreak in here or go around the outside there. Or Whereas the other man is <clears throat> knowing the circuit and and knowing where you're strong and knowing, um, you know, get the best out of every corner. Yeah. Uh, but that's difficult. You know, you're, you're pushing and sometimes you don't need to push because you're already getting a good lead or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's only when you get a signal, you might get two or three signalers so they'll put a board out for you right. at every, say, nine miles of the circuit. So you might go for five minutes before you actually see a board and you've gone past what they call a commentary point. Yep. And um, once you've broken that timing uh, beam, then then another two miles, three miles down the road, they'll put a board out saying yes. you're leading or 10th or 15th or whatever, you know. So it's all like it, it might be plus that one plus one, minus one, or, or minus two, or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you you know, it, sometimes it's that close, that, um, but you, you don't really know where you are, so that makes it quite quite unique, you know, whereas most other races are every starting together and um, going into the first corner together, etc. Yeah. So I guess an, another thing that might make this, this race unique is that you're actually racing through towns. You know, you you don't have your 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 sand traps and things. If you fall off around the corner, it, there's like I mean, if you watch it on TV, uh, you know, if you're watching a, a track race and and you see someone slide off their bike and it's all nice, and then they get up and they walk around and it's all it's all good. I mean, you're actually racing past someone's house and you've got people standing on on their lawn watching the bikes go past and you you've gone past the shops and the all the the light posts and the just whatever's in a normal town so that's that's quite a bit different i guess i mean that's 
Is that the yeah. is that the, is that part of the appeal to race then? Or? Um, yeah, I guess it is. In in the beginning, when you like say when you first go there and like I start, like I said, I st- <laughs> I started riding around too fast on the roads, and that used to give me the buzz, I guess, from mm. going fast on the roads because it's dangerous. Mm. If it's totally safe and anybody can do it, then the the buzz goes out of it. So right. so that point, yes, um, you do you start racing because of that feeling. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a different feeling to when you ride around, say, Brands Hatch or, you know, one of the short circuits. Um, you're pushing to a different sort of level or limit. Um, you're still pushing hard, mm. um, but in a different way. It, it's job to describe because, not because you haven't got the runoff, but the circuits, the, the Alamand is a lot bumpier than, even though it's smoother now these days than it used to be years ago, but it's still quite bumpy. It's a road at the end of the day, you know, where you yeah. get lorries and mm. vans and cars and everything going to work and you know so those lorries will make slight indents in the tarmac that weren't there last year or you know um so yeah it makes it it makes it unique and but yeah you you do um you do get the buzz from the um, from the fact that it is a little bit dangerous of course yeah. Um, and it's not a little bit dangerous it's a lot of dangerous of course <laughs> but um you know there's been a lot of people hurt a lot of people killed there um, but it's it's a bit like why do climbers, you know, um, climb Everest? Sure. You know, uh, there have been thousands killed up there, but you never hear about them. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's it's one of those ones. You know, it's it's not for the faint-hearted, and you know, even the people around you, families and mechanics and everybody, you know, they have to be strong as well because you know, if you if it's if it's one of those bad situations where you're off the hospital or worse then they have to be you know it's um yeah it is quite uh it's quite a different sport and you tell certain normal people <laughs> um about what you do or whatever and they think you're absolutely crazy you know because and i suppose it must look like that from the outside but like i say it's it's a lot of calculation goes on yeah. um but it is certainly the buzz from um going past people's houses and you know near walls and the sides of the hedges and you know like literally you're you're touching your sometimes you're almost touching your shoulder on yeah. the hedges or the walls you know um so i guess that that is the initial buzz you get from the racing in the beginning you know before you get to the level of the tt you know um, mm. um you do lesser events shall we say and you get to like i said about the um, the southern hundred or the the max grand prix a lot of people used to go to the max grand prix first yeah. Uh, do the Max Grand Prix and then um, then move on to the TT. So um, um, it's the same circuit, but um, it's more for the amateurs, should we say? And then right. they move on onto the onto the TT. So yeah, it's um, like I say, it is it is uh, very different. And uh, um, to describe to people who've never been or know anything about it, it is it is a bit mental, but. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, calculations name of the name of the game. Yeah, and so with with so little you know margin of error, um, uh, how do you get into the right mindset before you, you go before you start a race? Um, well, it starts a long time before you actually get to the race, even mm. get to the island. You know, your preparation starts eight months before maybe, mm-hmm. you know, um, you're thinking about it because it's one place that it's <clears throat> depending on who you are or whatever, but most people who have done it then afterwards, they uh, describe it as their main event of the year, you know, right. um, a lot of people will be doing the BSB series, which is the great Superbike series and then move, move there to, to, to do the, to do the TT or they might go to the Northwest 200 and, and then do the TT in, in that's in Northern Ireland. Um, but the preparation starts a long, long way before, you know, with everything. Um, but the mindset for it is you're just thinking about it a long way, be- a long way before, uh, yeah. a hell of a way before. Um, as far as coming to race day, that depends on how practice has gone. And like mm-hmm. I was saying earlier about how you've been able to, you know, how confident you are with the bike and how things have gone and how the bike is handling and 
you know, that is that's got a lot to do with it. Sometimes you're very rela- relaxed with it. Yep. And other times you're quite nervous. I'm I'm never really nervous to be honest, but I you know, it's not it's not you don't want to be or you you know, you, you think I'm I'm sort of apprehensive, I think is the word. Yeah. I'm not really a lot of people get so nervous it's unbelievable. Um you know, sick and all sorts of stuff, you know. Right. But I'm not. I'm not really like that. I don't know why, but um, I just, I just try and iron things out in my head that no one wanting to do, and you know, and and then you know roughly how hard you can push as well, because you yeah. you know, today on this bike, this ain't my race. You know, this is, this is, um, you just know before you go sometimes. Mm. I'll give it my best for the first sort of lap or something. But you, you know, sometimes you just know that it's not happening. You know, but yeah. you still you keep going and you do your best, of course. But you know, in the back of your mind that I'm going to struggle today, sort of thing. You know. Yeah. Um, but other times you're competitive as anybody, and um, you're not even more nervous then, though. You know, it's a strange one. Yeah, it's yeah, the apprehension's there for me, but it's not. It's not nervous. <laughs> Does it help that you've had a, uh, a staggered start when you're racing because you can't necessarily see the person in front and then you don't need to worry about those people so much? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it does, yeah, yeah, because you're only thinking about the bike and over a certain section, if, it, if, if it's misbehaving, shall we say, over a bumpy section of the, of the circuit, then you tend to think, you're sort of thinking about that part of the circuit rather than other riders, you know? Yeah. Because sometimes the other rider that you're thinking is going to win the race and beat you or whatever has broken down already because sometimes they break down and they pull off the circuit. You don't even know. You don't even see them. Yeah. So you never know to be finished. Maybe an hour and a half, two hours later, who's actually won or who's second or who's, you know, if, you know where you finish. You know roughly where you finished, but you don't know who else is there really sometimes you know you never see people sometimes you can do the whole race and not hardly see one one other rider yeah right. it's really strange <laughs> and other times you know you might pass loads of people you know yeah, yeah. Uh, or they might pass you you know unfortunately but <laughs> yeah. that's not a good that's not a good feeling for other people <laughs> you know when number 20 comes past you and you're number two or something that's that's not very good <laughs> they, they've made up a hell of a lot of time you know? <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's that's racing and that's where you have to and it yeah. sort of um, affects you a little bit as well, because when someone from a higher number passes you and you've only done maybe one lap, you think, wow, they've been a lot of time. Mm. Um, so it, it can get in your head as well. It can, it can make you think too much about uh, maybe I'm going too slow, too easy, you know, and I should have pushed harder from the beginning. And you, you sort of talk to yourself in, 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 your, in, in your mind, you know. Yeah, but you have to. You have to be while you're doing this. You're also looking where you're going at 200 mile an hour as well. You know? Yeah, and right. Concentrating on it as well. It sounds daft, but you've got yeah. it's got like a split mind in there. One one talking to you yourself, and yeah. the other one watching where you go in, if you like. Yeah, um, yeah. But it is it is certainly certainly a different sport, and yeah, it's something that you you Jeff definitely have to take it um, with like like I said, like an apprenticeship and. You know, um, walk before you run type thing. You know, because it, it can bite you. Um, yeah. But there, you know, some people go there and just click with it, and other people go there time after time after again, or never go back because they just find it too hard to, yeah. to actually learn it and to master it. You know. Is preparing for this race any different to preparing for another race? Um, In- there's more off the track to do. You know. Mm. like I say with um because when you move there you know you're there for three weeks it's one week practice basically and one week break uh, one week racing yep but you because it's an island you have to think about spares so you have to have spare engines and this spare this spare that, more so than if you were um you know on in, in England or Scotland or Wales or something yeah, or Northern Ireland or whatever, because you have to make sure that everything's with you. Because if you yeah. need an, an engine or engine part at the last minute um, to get parts to the island, you know, is is a bit difficult. So, because uh, obviously they are, they got to fly stuff in or come on the boats, which can take time. With time is something you don't have if you're racing the next day. So, 
yeah so that that preparation side especially you know with a team manager which I, i've done sort of my own team for a long time so um so i've always been involved with that side of it really uh even when you know was riding more and more myself um but, you know that side of it is a bit uh it's psychologically draining really um mm. the other man is you don't realize how much concentration you put into it until you come away from the place and then you realize how trained you are you're absolutely shattered for about two weeks yeah um it takes about two weeks to get over it i reckon 10 days two weeks um yeah because yeah, you, you are you are shattered you know and it's just the the thinking side of things not just on the circuit but off the circuit as well and and you, you you normally run maybe four bikes so you don't just have one bike one class you have four you know um so you have to think about you know the super twin this engine and whatever then then you have a super bike you have a super stock then you have a super sport yeah all got spares engines wheels tires fuel um mechanics enough helpers you know there's a, there's a lot to consider and that side of it is is the preparation really it's it's the hard bit like, where people don't see that you know they only see you jumping on a glossy motorbike and like you know, like anything in in life it all always looks really glamorous um they don't see you when you're working on the track uh, yeah, 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 yeah. you know <laughs> crawling underneath a big scan or something and <laughs> trying to get the oil pump or something um but um something like that but uh, no no it's uh it's, um you try and be as um, most uh, prepared as you can obviously and you know um but there's always something to you know to make it more difficult for you you know but uh yeah so there's a lot of preparation i suppose um i suppose that, you know if you're riding different classes and different different things it's is it is it a challenge to get used to each of the bikes when you when you're switching around i know you've got a, a practice practice sessions and and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff but i know that when i jump on a one bike and i'm only going up the road um you know then i jump on another bike it feels different it handles mm-hmm. differently um yeah. and 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 you're in a race where you you're doing some good speed does it does it take some time to get used to those bikes oh yeah 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 mm-hmm. um but you have to be adaptable you know um in the past i've sort of jumped from a one to five straight to a super bike mm. um and then sort of bike to a 600 or 600 to a superstar or a 250 you know so you have to be adaptable really some people manage it better than others um but it is difficult you know the the difference in a in a super bike compared to say a 125 then is unbelievable um, like i'm obviously small in stature compared to you know the likes of a, a peter hickman who was never going to get on the 125 but um <laughs> back in the day you know when i was uh, uh when the 125 class was at the element um, you know, I'd, I'd be doing that, and, and it, it is difficult. Um, but you, you have to adapt quick. Um, your braking markers and the power of the bike, and then you you think. As soon as you get on it, you think, right, what did this bike do in 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 the practice session or the last practice session? The changes we've made. Um, you know, everything is is uh, is there to. You know, sort of trip you up if you like, and but you have to, you know, have to adapt. Otherwise, you know, you the consequences are too great. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's just a matter of uh, adapting yourself quickly. And I, yeah, I've had other people, other riders say to me, "How did you used to do that? You know, ride and this, that." But I don't know. I just um, plus the fact you're doing it for a living, you're doing it for yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, where some people are not, you know, there's quite a lot of while, and it's not, it's not everybody's doing it. Um, you know as a profession but yeah. when you're doing a profession you have to think right you know this is this is mortgage sort of thing you know and yeah. uh, <laughs> rent or whatever you know so you have to you have to adapt and but it is difficult and you you can make mistakes you know like um like i said about breaking markers you know like for instance now down into um you've been on the on the bike for maybe only half a minute and you're into quarter bridge and it's a downhill first gear corner and you've got a full tank of fuel on mm. a super bike it's 24 liters and um on a, on a 125 you're actually breaking you know so much later right. on a 125 but you've still got a full tank of fuel and you've still yeah. got you know narrow wheels or whatever so it's all relative you can still fall off yeah or run, run on um 
but yeah, so <laughs> so I always think, well, it's, it's not just the big bike that's going to push you on down into the corner. So you have to adapt to that bike and that, you know, um, as soon as you can. So, but um, yeah, it is difficult when you, um, yeah. It's all about having that experience behind you. And and I guess ultimately the people racing in the, in the Isle of Man TT is, they're not weekend warriors. They're, they're all experienced people with, um, you know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you just can't turn up with the other man and go and ride your bike. No, no, it's, uh, you know, you've got to be accepted. You know, it's it's a certain level of rider gets in, you know. Yeah. Um, you, you, there are a lot of people get turned away. They don't even get a chance to ride. They, if, they, if the organisers think that you're not a certain level. Yeah. Um, you know, that, um, yeah, so, you know, you wouldn't even be allowed to um to start you know so it's a fairly high level um um it didn't used to be uh, back in the back a long time ago there were there was a lot of different levels should we say and there was some riders should we say we shouldn't have been there um but to make it they've made it now the organizer made such a professional uh job of it that um you know the the, um it it is uh, it is safer for Mm. all riders you know because nobody wants to arrive and scare another ride. You go past him that fast. And likewise, you don't want to be passed by, you know, um, somebody who's really fast and you're not knowing where you're going sort of thing. Yeah. Well, that used to happen in, in the old days, um, but not these days, you know, that you're vetted and you're, you know, watched and um, before you even get in it, you know, get, they'll know who you are and what, what sort of championships you've done and, um, you know, it's a good thing, and they've raised the bar with the Alaman. It's good. Mm. Unfortunately, the prize money's gone down, but <laughs> that's just me. I'm on a whinge, <laughs> but um, it's the truth. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's uh, yeah, how it is like everything in life, everything becomes more and more expensive, and yeah. it is a vastly expensive sport. You know? So, have you so have you seen the the race? get safer in your time oh yeah yeah they, they're doing as much as they can you know? yeah you'll, you'll yeah. never make the other man safe mm. but you they definitely made it safer you know yeah. um there's a lot of uh, rector cell safety bills now in certain areas yeah. um it helps you know um but it it's it's never gonna make make it a make it a short circuit and like you say with gravel traps and mm. Um, there are certain bits they've done with that, you know, moved hedges and made things right. wider. And um, but yeah, it's too big, you know. It's <laughs> you know they have to move so much scenery. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. You know, um, but they've done a lot with the Ulster Grand Prix, which unfortunately is not, it's my favourite race actually. Yeah. Um, but they're um, they're not uh, they're not actually running that circuit this year, the Ulster Grand Prix. And they've done so much work on that moving the hedges and various posts out the way and removable ones they put back in for the farmers later. Right. But um, yeah, um, that is only seven and a half miles. Well, this is thirty-eight miles, so yeah, almost yeah, thirty yeah. miles. So yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> there, there are too many walls and things to you know to move on. So yeah, it's yeah. difficult for them, you know, and. But that's all you can do is try and make it as safe as possible and, and go from there. Yeah. And you you mentioned um, prize money a minute ago, so I'm, I'm interested to know what is the prize money for the, for something like this? Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> it's never, never enough. <laughs> no. It's um, obviously enough to keep you coming back the next year. Well, yeah. It's a funny one, isn't it? Um, it's one of those you don't you don't go there in the beginning for money. Mm. That's the point, and mm. it sort of grabs you uh, because it like it's like I said, it's it's like a bug as we as we said earlier. Yeah. Um. And you and you you do it for that reason. You do it for the buzz and the enjoyment and the camaraderie with other riders and yeah. other mechanics and other riders' mechanics. Even you know you, it's all like a, a massive family, really. The paddock. Yeah. Um. But you know, um, to make it into a professional thing, um, you know, you have to pay people 
money and you know, sure. a lot of the, you know, be a lot of riders get start money, should we say, to help hit um, like travel allowance to go there. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So, but it's okay. certainly, you're not certainly not going to make yourself a millionaire out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes you're lucky to break even. So, yeah. And you mentioned camaraderie uh, with, uh, with other riders and, and crew and, and that kind of thing. Is that something that, you know, those, those bonds, they last, throughout the year and into you know into extra years and all that kind of thing oh yeah yeah Yeah. i've got you know friends that um, i've known since i started racing you know and um uh yeah and and you know like the riders i mean or or even mechanics and you know families you know fathers of the um brothers of you know of the riders and things isn't just the rider you know, because they usually get in the beginning, you get a brother, like my brother helped me in the beginning, Nigel, he helped me. Um, so, um, you know, he would have friends in the paddock. It, it doesn't come anymore with me, but, you know, he did for a lot of years. So he would yeah. know a lot of the people. Um, and that's the way it goes. Or you might know somebody's fathers and uncles and yeah. whoever, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it is It is like a big family. But the sad thing is, is when somebody gets hurt, or mm. then you know them as well, you know, when you yeah, feel sure. for them as well. So, um, but that's like I say, that's part of, you know, it's motorsport, and you'll never make it safe, you know. I, I, and I always say to people, you know, it's motorsport is doesn't matter if you're doing 15 mile an hour, you stop dead in your car or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You haven't got a helmet on or whatever, you're gonna get hurt. So yeah, okay, you're doing 200 mile an hour, you're gonna hurt yourself more. I'm not saying, but um, you know, sometimes you can come off worse by having. A crash at 30 mile an hour then you cannot then coming off at over 100 mile an hour you know yeah <clears throat> just the, just the way you land and stop you know is, is the yeah. question um but um yeah I, i've come up you know I've, I've been lucky enough not to get too injured um like i said i've broken collarbones and shoulders and ankles and fingers and things but nothing too serious you know not, not yeah. um you know ribs ribs are one of the the most sore things I think anybody who's broken his ribs would probably <laughs> <coughs> probably second me with that one. Uh, and shoulders, shoulders are quite, yeah, quite a bit, you know, yeah. quite painful as well. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it says a lot for the um, for the safety gear that that the riders wear. I mean, I've said there's been some nasty crashes out there, um, and that, I guess that's the same in in any race, you know. But um, and there's broken bones and there's bits and pieces. Uh, but you know, quite often, you know, people are getting, you know, they they need to recover and all that kind of stuff. But the kind of gear that they that they're wearing, you know, it says a lot about it says a lot about that that gear. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, like um, I forgot to mention that to be honest, because it's it's one of the things that <clears throat> when I started racing, like the boots we used to wear were like slippers, basically. Yeah, you know, it was just they were nice to wear. Don't get me wrong, but when you crashed, they were like maybe two layers of, of leather, and that was it. Yeah. Where now you've got plastic over the your heels and your you know over your, all your ankle and over the front and up the shin bones and and then the leathers are another another world altogether. Yeah. Um, these days they've got um, like a um, like a blow up suit that goes off if you have a oh, if yeah. you have a crash, you know. So um, they use the airbag system. Airbag, yeah. Airbag yeah, system. Yeah. yeah. So um although I'm not too sure, I know some people wear them in the other man, but um mm. yeah, because the problem is <clears throat> you jump around that much on the bike and you land at such force, you know, it could go off when you're riding the bike. Yeah, right. And that's the disaster then because you you probably be hardly be able to see where you're going. Yeah, yeah. So but I know some people are, are using them. Um, yeah, so they yeah. must work okay, but um like I said, I've never, I've never used one yet, yeah. uh, but I know they're being brought into the short circuit side of things more and more. Um, and you know everything like uh, the gloves, um, helmets are fantastic now compared to what they used to be. You know that like we used to have <laughs> the visors were barely closed. You know, like every time you got off the bike, hit the air inside they get up into your eyes. Yeah, you know, um, like I get dry eyes if put stuff in my eyes, but. Um, I think it's <laughs> they've only been dried out for all the wind going up there. <laughs> so, uh, um, but yeah, you know, like they look like say they'd hardly close it. 
these days they're superb. You know, they don't miss up very well, very rarely. Um, the gloves are great, everything. But obviously, everything you know, they've got padding in, on the elbows and shoulders and hips and things. Yeah. Um, but back in you know back in the day, the the old leathers they weighed absolutely nothing. They were just like you know just like putting a pair of jeans on, really. Yeah, right. Uh, not much, not much heavier than that. The whole leathers, you know. Um, but um, so the downside is that you've got more protection. <laughs> you've got the the heavier. I mean. Um, but the upside is you've got much, much, much more protection. So, yeah, you can you can get away with a lot more these days. You know, definitely, you know, short circuits all all on the roads. You know, it's uh, they're fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. Nice. We've got a question here that's come in from Osman. Says, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, what was your what was your most favourite bike that you have ever ridden? And if you could no. only take one. Uh, any any race bike or, or road bike? Uh, my favourite bike I've ever ridden at the Alamand. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I actually quite like riding the NSR 500 V Twin because mm. it's a two stroke and it wasn't fast enough. It was probably lacking 10 or 15 mile an hour. In yeah. a straight line. This is we're going back to 1998, 99. And uh they were only built, they only made something like 30 or 40 of them, I think. And I was lucky enough to ride. Um well, the first one I rode was Joey, Joey Dunlop's bike. Because yep. he uh, he'd broken his collarbone <clears throat> and he lost the end of his in his uh, wedding um ring finger and uh two weeks earlier. So mm-hmm. and he had a broken collarbone as well. So um he managed to ride the 125 and 250. And, he, and if he didn't want to ride that, I could ride it. And yeah. I rode it and I was lying third and broke down on it. And then the following year, I had another ride on similar bike, but not, not the same bike. And I finished third in the senior. And I really enjoyed riding. I could ride it like, it was like a big 250. Um, uh, fantastic thing to ride. Because um, I obviously come from the two-stroke world. It's not so many of us left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah so... Uh, starting on those and, in, and enjoying the most, I think. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was probably one of my favourites. I'm not saying the favourite. I think the Taz uh, TAS Suzuki. It was at the time. Yeah. I rode for Hector and Philip um, back in 2002 and finished second. To my teammate was David Jeffries, um, and we got it. We got. The thing handling for me, um, like it, David, it was a great giant of a man and could hang on to it, well, whatever. But um, I sort of struggled to to get it right for the first race and the second race I got it right. So <clears throat> in his last ever race, he only lapped six, just over six seconds faster than me. Um, so that that was um, I'm quite proud of that achievement because David was a very good rider, yeah. um, and that was a very good bike at that time, you know. Um, I think we lapped it at almost 127. So that, that was really fast speed at that at that time. That's yeah. what 20 years ago now. So um so yeah, um there have there have been so many bikes I've ridden, that's the yeah, thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. 250s are, are absolutely beautiful things to ride around there. Um uh I rode Colin Edwards SP2, which was which was good. Hmm. Um but it was um I, did, I think I ended up the second or the third, but it was it was a proper uh, factory SP2 Honda uh, yeah. from Honda. And they ran it and for me, and so I was on a works bike, and it had won the world championship the very same bike the year before. So <laughs> lots of pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there was no pressure at all. It was great, and um, it was just the fact that uh, we had to run the wrong tires up until the day before the race. The race, right. Um, the bike it was not making the bike handle very well at all, so we managed to switch brands overnight, and then I never got any practice on it. But it was a, it was a, it was a very nice bike and a beautiful factory thing. Uh, so yeah, so there'll be many bikes really. Um, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. So road bikes, um, best road bike I've had was was a question, was it? Yeah, that was part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a. An XT500 I used to like riding. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was good for wheelies. Not with me, I don't know. 
And um, what else? A GSM 50. That was good for getting away from the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, various ones. But um, recently, no, I, I, I don't ride much on the road. Um, although I've, uh, I've had a, a good example. I've had, I've had a Honda Baradero sat in my garage for 21 years. And I've just sold it. It's like brand new. And it did 4,000 miles. After yeah. 21 years from new, so yeah, it's it's a shame, a crying shame. But we never get a chance to ride, you know, because they're always yeah. racing. Or summertime is is you know is racing and racing, and winter time it's freezing cold and icy. So, um, so yeah, don't get much of a chance to to ride on the roads, unfortunately. But there are some great road bikes out there now, mind. So well, that was one um, question I was going to ask you too. Has has being a part of it? Has it being a racer and being part of all these races? ruined the um the thrill of the weekend ride down the countryside uh i think you see the dangers more right yeah and it's easy to ride especially on like country lanes to go over the other side of the road because you don't even you don't think about it yeah and then yeah. all of a sudden you have to slap yourself and think <laughs> oh no don't do that you know you're not racing so you know, especially at first you know um but you definitely see the dangers you know you you're more worried about because when you're racing everything's going the same way yeah all, all the traffic's going the same way yeah, um yeah. but um when you when you're on the roads obviously you've got cars and tractors pulling out and all sorts of things could be happening so it makes you more aware i think you know mm. um so but yeah i enjoy it when i when i when i have done it yeah um you know like i went to aston one year i had Af africa twin yeah. um and also on the Baradero went there on that. Um, so I, I, I do enjoy riding on the road, but it's not very often I get the chance to do it much anymore. Yeah. And, yeah. We've got one, uh, one more question, um, and it's it's come through uh, from Osman. Uh, and it's probably a good one to, to close off the webinar. Uh, he asks, uh, how would you get young people to follow in your footsteps? Mm, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> and you would get one to stump you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I, well, we're sort of involved quite a bit with younger riders with our team. And um, we just come back from Silverstone this very today, actually. <laughs> um, and at the BSB meeting, we had a young Swiss Italian rider riding for us. He's 16. Um, and that was very nice to work with him. Uh, but to, to actually encourage them to, to come and race, um, mm, that's a difficult one, really. Um, yeah, you have stumped me there a bit. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Nice to, it's nice to get these young riders when they're already sort of doing a, doing a bit of riding and, you know, and then uh, like the rider did on the weekend and they listen to you and you, mm. you get prepare the bike for them and then you work with them and they, they give you good feedback and that's really satisfying for me for, mm. a, for a team manager, the position I'm in now. Um, but um, to actually get them into the sport initially, um, you stumped me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess they need to have that, that, that spark. And we've sort of come full circle now to um, where, where you, you got a spark somehow. Yeah, yeah. I think it's different in the old days as well, where yeah. you had to sort of be able to drive yourself. That, so pass a car license, that's 17 in the UK, and then start riding, uh, sorry, driving uh, before you can even get to the meetings. So then you were all, almost 18 before you started. Well, these days, it's lads and dads. So the lad starts when he's six-year-old riding a motocross or something. Uh, but I was talking to somebody on the weekend, funnily enough, and, and he's got a like a, um, a dirt track school, and he teaches dirt track. And, then, and he's built this dirt track um, uh, like flat track, you know, um, not not no jumps or anything on it. But it goes mm -hmm. from left and right. It's on little uh, CRF 100 motocross bikes. Yep. And um, he's built it in a massive shed, so you can do it inside. So that yeah, that right. runs all year round now. Yeah, so yeah. and they get all sorts of riders from, you know, your you know your um, that's in Lincolnshire, and and all sorts of top riders go there to just keep fit on the bike, you know. Yeah. Um, during during the winter and keeps you sharp. But it's it's getting more and more difficult to to get on a circuit, especially if you're young. Mm. If you're, unless you're over eighteen, 
a lot of the circuits won't have you on the circuit. So right. it's, not, it's sort of stopping the younger riders from riding on the circuit, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but they're encouraging you to race, but not go on the circuit until you're actually racing. <laughs> so you can't, you can't practice, if you know what I mean. You can't yeah. go to a circuit, practice that circuit, and then go there and go and, you know, and, and get any experience on the circuit. Yeah. Until you actually get to the race meeting. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's, it's a bit of a wrong way to do it. But, you know, um, but yeah, it's good to have young people racing. But I think ultimately road racing um, is, a, is a sort of a man's sport. Um, and I think they should be a little bit older, you know. Yeah. Your, your 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds, I'm not really, not really a fan of having a world champion by the time they're 15. Yeah. And it burnt out by the time they're 25, you know? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, I think if you become a man, you would be go, still going in your 30s. It's no problem at all. But um, that's my own opinion. And, you know, yeah. I, I don't get the thing, you know, with, I know everything's getting younger and younger, but I don't really know the reason for that. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Hope that, hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um <laughs> Well, it looks like we've we've come to the hour, so I I just want to thank you um, for taking the time out to um, to to speak with me at the biker bar today. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and um, yeah, and I'm and, and I'm thankful for you to for coming on and, and speaking with us. And I'm and I'm sure a lot of people watching this um, will get a lot out of it. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. I, I've enjoyed it. It's, it's nice to uh, relive some of the old memories. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very well, much. Well, you take care. Okay. I'll see you, mate. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.